In a world that's shifting towards the digital realm ever more quickly, the acoustic piano is no longer the only way to knock Baby Grand off that bucket list. And few companies have struck as fine a balance between the traditional and the innovative as Roland has with their GP series. The question is, are these good enough to lure would-be acoustic shoppers their way, or is this nothing more than expensive eye candy? Let's dive in and find out just how far the GP9 and digital piano technology generally has moved the needle. The Roland GP9 has been touted as a modern masterpiece of acoustic engineering and digital wizardry, bringing to bear a ground-up rebuild of their modeling tone engine, multi-channel amplifiers, and one of the most accurate key detection systems ever produced. The big question to me is how close this gets to the real thing, and are the other features and advantages enough to make up for the musical compromises if there are any. So let's get right into the critical specs of this GP9. First of all, the tone is being driven by the newly updated Piano Reality Modeling Concert Sound Engine. Now this is the update, of course, to the Supernatural Acoustic Engine, Roland's last and best update under the Supernatural banner. This brings limitless polyphony to any time you're playing with the principal acoustic piano patches. Otherwise, you've got a maximum polyphony of 256. Besides the core acoustic piano tones, you've got 320 additional sounds covering pretty much every category of tone you could possibly expect out of a digital piano. The keyboard type is now called the Piano Reality Hybrid Concert Keyboard, which is an update to the Grand Hybrid action previously seen on the LX706 and LX708. That action is notable for a couple of reasons. The bang on accurate down weight of that action is almost identical to what you're gonna find on about a six foot grand piano. In addition, the pivot length of that action is also gonna be very close to that of an acoustic grand piano. It comes with escapement simulation. It also comes with a stabilizer pin in the back, which they don't really make mention of on the spec sheet, but I consider to be one of the most important engineering aspects of this action. And uh, exclusive to the GP9, these keys also have haptic key vibrations, something previously only Yamaha was bringing to market. And I can tell you in the upper and lower ranges on the GP9, you can really feel this. Uh, it makes quite a difference to the authenticity of the experience. When it comes to the speakers, we've got eight in total, and the speaker system here really is the crown jewel of the GP9. Rather than simply taking a stereo signal from the tone generator and then splitting it off with either crossovers or some type of digital signal processing, each of these eight speakers actually has discrete audio streams coming from the tone generator, which are then driving digital amplifiers directly attached to the speaker. So in other words, the signal doesn't actually get converted to analog until the very moment that the speaker is actually activating. Not only does this generally create a very clean signal right to the speaker, but the control Roland has to now fully immerse you in all of the various primary and secondary sounds that would normally happen on a grand piano is just incredible. And it's certainly not lacking for power. There's a total of 150 watts coming out of these amplifiers, delivering everything from the primary tone to the mechanical noises of the action to your resonance engines. One last thing about the sound system, the soundboard is a lot more than eye candy. There's actually quite a bit of vibration and resonance coming off the surface of that soundboard, really creating a much more immersive rather than a highly pinpoint directed uh, sense of sound. Nothing too surprising with the pedal system. Your right main damper pedal is capable of continuous detection or what some other companies might call half pedaling. Uh, this is also connected to a true damper modeling engine and you've really got to try this uh, because the effect is uncanny. Your soft pedal or your left pedal or unicorda is also capable of continuous detection uh, and you can assign a different function to that depending on the sound you're using and your middle pedal uh, is also sostenuto, um, which is also function assignable. The cabinet on the GP9 is made of a sturdy wood construction, which is coated in an authentic polyester finish. This is the same type of finish that acoustic pianos use. Uh, one great thing about this is it's buffable, so you can repair it pretty well for the entire lifetime of the instrument. When it comes to editability, you've got close to 20 parameters to play with, and given how precise and detailed the speaker system is, you are actually going to want to play around with this. You've got ambience control, i.e. reverb, uh, with quite a few different hall simulators to play with. You've got 100 degrees of touch sensitivity, which I really love uh, because dialing in touch sensitivity is one of the most important things you can do to creating a connective experience with you and your digital piano. It's loaded up with hundreds of internal songs, most of those related to lesson materials. It's got the ability to play back WAV files and MP3 through a USB key. You can also record WAV to a USB key. 
but most likely you're going to want to make use of the wireless Bluetooth MIDI and audio, which allows you to connect with the Roland Piano app as well as other DAW software and portable devices. The GP9 has all of the basic functions that you'd expect on any bit digital piano at this point, including the ability to split the instrument, transpose, uh, use a metronome, uh, use rhythm patterns behind it, as well as layer two sounds at once. In terms of jacks and other connectivity, You've got two quarter inch audio outs, which is great for connecting to stereos. You've got USB A and B ports, two phone jacks, uh, both the 3.5 millimeter as well as the quarter inch type. And although it seems like an odd thing to mention, despite the fact that this weighs about 375 pounds, this is one of the easiest instruments I've ever moved. You can push this with about two fingers if you need to. So that rounds out all of the critical specs on this brand new GP9 from Roland. So the two piano patches that you're gonna spend most of your time on, I would think, uh, particularly if you're playing the solo, are gonna be the concert piano and the studio piano. And I go back and forth between these two in terms of which one I uh, more connect with. I find that when I'm in a less resonant space, a uh, carpeted area or a smaller room, the concert piano tends to be the one where my ear is, is, is more happy. Uh, when I'm in a larger space where some of those highs can sometimes get swallowed up, I find that the studio piano is giving me more of what I'm, I'm looking for and really giving me the sense that I'm behind, you know, a, a, a kind of a pretty decent uh, acoustic baby grand piano in, in a lot of situations. So I'm gonna play both patches for you. Um, but I will say in the space that we're in right now, stage piano is the one that really uh, presents to me uh, the very best. And I've done a little bit of editing with both of these patches. So here is the stage piano. Here is the concert piano. So slightly different timbre to both of those. The concert piano has definitely got more of that New York Steinway sound to it, that at, uh, sort of more prominent um, mid-range. When I say mid-range, I'm not talking about the mid-range of the piano. I mean, every single note has kind of a whole spectrum to it and the kind of the mid uh, partials uh, or the mid harmonics on a lot of those notes. Whereas the stage piano has more of a German piano sound.
So this piano is really not just about the signal that's being generated because it sounds great through headphones. Uh, it really is about the experience of playing it with the speakers and hearing all of these different elements of sound hitting you from, from different angles. So you can definitely feel uh, the haptic uh, uh, key vibration. And so as you're starting to dig in, that's kind of a nice... Uh, kind of a nice point of familiarity. It's not easy to have an array of speakers delivering similar frequencies um, split more than just a, a stereo pair. You, it's very difficult to avoid, you know, phasing or weird kind of stereo image stuff. Um, and I really noticed on the last, the last LX series, really kind of achieve a natural sound stage uh, effect. And I think that was part of what uh, connected me so much to, for example, the Kawhi Novus 5, was just the positioning of the speakers, the array of the speakers, and how they were able to channel different components of the sound really created this natural sound stage, this natural kind of three-dimensionality to what you were hearing. Now, I tend to prefer keys that sit slightly on the heavier side, not like obnoxiously heavy, but I do find that a little more resistance also gives me a little more control and therefore a little more nuance in, in how I play. So I usually set this uh, with a heaviness factor of about uh, 60 in, in, the, in the touch curve. Uh, and uh, to compensate uh, for that, I will sometimes uh, either switch to the stage piano, as I've mentioned, to give me sort of a brighter tone uh, to combat that, to that, that velocity curve, uh, or a combination of both the brilliance uh, the uh, tone selection as well as uh, the key weight. Now if I close my eyes and play some of those low notes, I could be completely fooled that I was listening to a real nine foot. Yeah, as you start to get up into the mid-range there's about an octave in here where the dynamic is just a little more lively than what I would expect on a real piano. So you could get in and do individual note editing in there if you really wanted to. As soon as you get up sort of into concert A territory, Yeah, super clear and just a beautiful bloom on that on that attack. Up into the treble.
That has like, that is uncanny in the top octave. Like your ear swears that you're hearing like that hammer hitting a string like right there. It's crazy. That's so cool. You know, when I'm listening to all of these speakers and I'm thinking like, okay, so we've got this tone engine, it's sending individual audio streams to each one of these speakers. It's not being split up with crossovers or it's not a stereo signal that's now being like digitally reprocessed after it's left the tone engine. And just the cleanliness of the signal. I mean, there's just no artifact in there where you're like, oh yeah, I can hear that's, that's digital. Um, or you can sort of hear like it's a lower fidelity decay or anything like that. It's a nice full tone, um, and it's definitely the closest that I've ever heard Roland get to sort of that uncompressed, uncompressed full tone that you get out of Kawhi's top tone engine. But I mean, the speaker system and just how faithfully it's reproducing this is just crazy. And then in combination with the haptic stuff, like. Like I said, the bottom octave and top octave is so close that honestly, I, I, that would come very close to fooling me if I was in a blind test. So as to the question whether this has really moved the needle to the point where it's going to start scooping what could have been an acoustic piano customer and tipping them towards digital. This is gonna like check a lot of boxes for a lot of um, hobbyist players, casual players, uh, prior classical players that are looking for something that's really fun, uh, that you know feels 95% of what they'd be able to get out of say a 10 or $15,000 new acoustic grand piano. And they don't wanna go down the road of used and, and some of the uh, challenges that go along with that. It's an interesting option. So thank you so much for checking out this review and first look at the GP9 here at the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison. Hope you've enjoyed it and got something out of it. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you did because we'd love to see you back for more videos as a regular viewer. Until next time, take care. We'll see you soon.